In Normandy during the early hours of the 9th of August 1944, a Canadian battle group under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Donald Worthington left the forming up point and crossed the line of departure on their mission to secure point 195 north of Falaise. When daylight broke, Worthington confidently reported that he had achieved his mission and requested immediate support to defeat the Germans who were now attacking him. However, Worthington had become lost overnight and was now six kilometers east of his intended destination. Miles from support and surrounded, his battle group was destroyed at the cost of 240 casualties and 47 tanks lost. Worse still, their destruction was captured on film as the tanks of the 12th SS Panzer Division closed in. Okay, we're at Brettville Soleil's for this video, which is all about the Worthington Force. Now, unfortunately, this isn't a particularly happy story, as many of these often aren't. The Worthington Force was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Worthington, and it was essentially a battle group. He led this battle group on an offensive to Hill Point 195, or at least that's where he thought he was going. And unfortunately, the battle group took a wrong turn and veered off in the wrong direction, away from their support, and importantly, away from their artillery support as well. So the battle group headed down a road, which I'm going to show you now, which took them behind the enemy lines. And unfortunately, once the enemy realized that uh, the Canadians were behind their lines, they were basically in a really good position to counterattack them. And they destroyed the Worthington force in their fortress position. You've likely figured out by now that Lieutenant Colonel Worthington died with the majority of his men, and we are here to visit his grave at Brettville Salaise. Lieutenant Colonel Donald Worthington was a commanding officer within the British Columbia Regiment, but he had also command of the infantry from the Algonquin Regiment. When tasked all together and supplemented with other elements, this is referred to as a battle group. He was considered by Major General George Kitchen, the commander of the 4th Canadian Armour Division, to be the outstanding regimental commander in the Armoured Brigade. He was the youngest, full of energy and quick to seize an opportunity. Now, located next to him is his brother, Jay Worthington. Now, Jack Worthington was promoted the day after his brother was killed and assigned command of a squadron. He led his squadron in Operation Tractable and the follow-on offensive operations. In the confusion of that advance, Jack's tank was mistaken and he was actually strafed by the Royal Air Force by a Typhoon attack fighter. He was mortally wounded by friendly fire and he died having been turned over to a Polish medical evacuation unit. They are buried side by side because their father had requested they be buried together. So let's look at the ground in general and of course we're in Normandy but we're going to look at a piece of ground which is south of Caen. We've highlighted it here. Operation Totalize is a multi-phase offensive operation, and it would take me some time to explain this adequately, so I'm going to try and make this as simple as I possibly can. Now, this image shows the main route from Caen in the north to Falaise in the south. And here is the town of Simpho, now near the site of the Canadian Cemetery, but on August the 8th, 1944, it was the forward line of own troops for the Canadians. The Worthington force had received orders to conduct a forward passage of lines through the Lake Superiors, they were to penetrate a German screen and continue to advance southeast before seizing spot height 195. As Colonel Worthington says, the tanks will do the fighting, keep moving and try to reach the objective by daylight. And therein lies the main issue. This mission would take place at night, in the dark, in indistinct terrain with little or no pine. So what happened? Well, the battle group ended here at point 140 deep inside enemy defences with no reinforcements and no artillery support. They were isolated and they were lost. They were also six kilometres from their objective. Okay. 
So this road we're stood on now is right next to uh, a main D route. So it's really, really busy and you probably can't hear me very well. But the road that I'm actually stood on was the original main road heading north south, which is the route that the Worthington force should have taken. So they should have kept following north south down towards hill 195. And what actually happened as I approached this corner is that they became disorientated and they turned off onto this route right here heading left. But what that means is that the Worthington force ended up heading down this route for about six kilometers or so and they end up being completely isolated. Now this is the actual route that they did take and they headed straight down that way and the reason they became disorientated and followed the incorrect route is because they were under attack at the time they were receiving small arms fire harassing fire from the village down there and as we get down this road there are actually some 88 millimeter guns in a field that also caused them to become disorientated and as they picked up the road again they assumed that this straight track down the bottom there was this main road but it wasn't unfortunately as they rejoined the route they assumed that this road was the main road and they headed in the wrong direction the German defensive screen was designed to disrupt the Canadian offensive with pockets of infantry and anti-tank guns in the wooded areas shown here. When we overlay reconnaissance images, we can see the track marks of the Worthington force attempting to bypass this resistance. Well, I'm now looking back towards the start line where we just came from. So the junction with the wrong turning is ahead of me, probably less than a kilometer in that direction. The Worthington force should have been over there and you can see the original route which follows the main highway. Hopefully you can see the traffic moving left to right across your screen. So if we look back you can see just how far you're going to be taken off your intended route by following this incorrect road. They were well off course already. Now up ahead, the Worthington force encountered German resistance from machine gun in the church tower, which you can see there, and also some resistance to the wood, which is to the right, although the wood was much smaller back then. Now this all reinforced to the Worthington force that they were on the right route. It confirmed their assumptions that the German resistance would be ahead of them and they then attempted to bypass it rather than becoming decisively engaged. There was far less wood to the right than there is today. And remember, you cannot take a compass bearing in a tank. It was dark and they were in contact. The blue route is the one that they should have taken, tracking the main route north to south. The yellow route is the one that they actually did take, bypassing the resistance. They moved around and they came across another straight road and they assumed this was the straight road of the main highway that they should have been following. But of course, we know that it's the wrong road. There aren't actually many straight roads in Normandy, so to come across another one was probably quite rare for them. Now we know this happened because we can see their movements in the aerial pictures and this is where the error occurred. Well, it's now really windy, hopefully you can still hear me. But this is the route that they took and this is actually representative of what those tracks looked like in 1944. We think of them as being metal roads, but actually they weren't. So if you have two tracks that look just like this and they both look straight, which is what you've been told to, uh, to, to look for, a straight Roman road that's heading north-south, you very well can understand why they uh, became confused. Now, the issue though, is that they did not pick up that they've been traveling on this route for a number of kilometers in the wrong direction. 
arguably, if we're being critical, they probably should have done, but I will never criticize commander's decisions when I don't necessarily have the full facts myself and I'm not under that pressure. They were in contact a lot of the time as well. What I really, what I really don't like is when historians and people who have never served or don't have any experience of what it's like to be under fire start criticizing commander's decisions. It really doesn't sit well with me. So that's not the intention of this video. But what they could have done as a collective from a, a team perspective is check each other's maps, grids. Instead, they went along with this confirmation bias, which is absolutely deadly. So the next thing that happened as they approached this area was they encountered resistance from that wood right in front of us. Now, that wood right down there had small arms fire and I believe anti-tank, um, uh, an anti-tank gun that was firing up this road as well. So again, more confirmation bias that they're heading in the right direction. The Germans are down there. They also then, over to the right, encountered um, what they believe was 88 millimeter fire from a field just down there. So again, they believe they're pushing on towards their objective. Now, remember as well that this would have been very low light, lots of dust kicked up by armored vehicles. And I'll put some footage of the dust that is generated by armored vehicles, just so you can understand how disorientating it can be. Especially when it's dark as well, because the sun was just about to come up. You can understand exactly how this happened. The final point is that they were trying to aim for a high feature called Hill 195. And sure enough, over on the horizon there is a high feature. So all of these things are influencing the commander to allow him to believe that he's doing the right thing and he's heading in the right direction. And so far he'd made great progress. But unbeknownst to him, he was actually heading in the wrong direction behind the enemy lines. So they continued along this track until they reached the high point, still believing they were heading towards their objective. When they arrived at the high point, they reported they had reached Hill 195, where they would establish a fortress position. I'm now at the memorial to the Worthington Force, which says, to the soldiers of the 28th Canadian Armoured Regiment, the British Columbia Regiment, and the Algonquin Regiment, who on the 9th of August, on the surrounding area of Hill 140, not 195, gave their lives for freedom. And here, on the 9th of August 1944, in Phase 2 of Operation Totalize, Worthington Force, the 28th Armoured Regiment of the British Columbia Regiment, and the Algonquin Regiment, as part of 4th Canadian Armoured Division, was tasked with securing the high ground overlooking fillets. On and around Hill 140, Worthington Force fought a desperate and stubborn engagement against their most determined enemy. Their courage and sacrifice remains unsurpassed in the annals of the Canadian Army. Well, now we come to the enemy. So the local commander responsible for the German counterattack was SS Oberfuhrer Kurt Mayer, and he was in command of the 12th SS Panzer Division. Kampfgruppe Vordmiller held the high ground around Hill 140, and the 501st SS Tiger Battalion was to the west in Kusne Woods. It was SS Übersturm Bahnführer Max Wunsch who organized his tanks to launch an attack on the Canadians supported by artillery and mortar fire. And at this point, Colonel Worthington had about 31 Sherman tanks, including a Sherman Firefly armed with the 17-pounder gun, but more tanks would arrive shortly. There is one issue though, and that is that the Canadians weren't on this hill right here. This is a convenient location to have memorial. The location where they actually fought this final action, essentially their, their Alamo, you could call it, was over here in the distance, in a field in front of that wood block over there. And it's about half a mile walk. 
I'm going to head across that field now and go and have a look for you. So let's now look at the ground in some detail, and here we can see the route taken by the Worthington force and the defensive position that they established. This was a rectangle field with four to six foot high hedges all around its perimeter. The German forces occupied the wooded areas nearby, but they had been taken by surprise. The Canadian force had achieved a breakthrough. It was just in the wrong area. And here we can see another one of those excellent images showing the Worthington force in the defensive position during this battle. For reference, you can also see this small rectangle wood where the nearest Germans were located, and these images are a snapshot in time. As we zoom in, you can actually see the defensive fortress positions with the individual vehicles, and this would become the Canadian Alamo. confirmation bias so the Worthington force came from that direction right through that wood block following that road they approached this hill this is a really steep hill they were told to reach hill 195 this would look like hill 195 you can see the summit is right over there it's a big hill I'm now walking on a track to the fortress position, or the last stand position. And this is somewhere I've wanted to visit for ages. Now, we haven't spoken about artillery yet. And importantly for the Wormington force, they were without artillery support for their advance to Hill 195. And it's fair to say, artillery support for the battle group completely failed on the 9th of August, 1944. Three units, 19th and 23rd field regiments, and the British 11th medium regiment, along with the Foos, from each of those regiments were allocated to support the battle group. However, the two Canadian artillery regiments also got lost when traveling to their new positions and they did not get into action until 1420 in the afternoon. The British forward observation officer talking to the British battery had broken down prior to the departure and so he jumped in the wagon of one of the OCs. Unfortunately, his radio was not working and he had become separated with his assistant. So I'm now inside the fortress position and you can see the hedges of the fortress boundary have now gone. However, the edge of the field remains and you can see the separation between the green and the brown field. And remember, this would have had a four to six foot hedge all the way around it, approximately 300 meters by 100 meters forming a rectangle. And so we know that I'm stood right in this corner and we're going to walk to the other end of the fortress position. And you can see the thick hedgerow on one side. It wasn't quite this thick in 1944, but it was like this all the way along on two sides. We've now reached the next corner of the fortress, right at the edge of this wood. Right, this is basically the corner of this little wood block here, this um, very thick hedge, is the corner of the field where the Worthington force established their defensive location. And it ran down this darker line, if you can see it in the soil, I'll try and draw a line through the ground. It ran that way, pretty much a line through me, through to the, uh, the hay bale stack, if you can see that which is just sort of center screen now. And then it ran along this hedgerow. Now the field was completely um, surrounded by a low hedge and on one side was a much thicker hedge. So this is the thicker side that you can see here. Wouldn't have been as thick as that in 1944, but this is reasonably thick. And then all around the field was a low hedge. And that hedge essentially had uh, locations where they could place their armoured vehicles, they could have their tanks. And although we call it a fortress position, which is what uh, the Worthington Force set up here, essentially a fortress position is just the nomenclature used during 1944 to describe an all-round defensive position. So 
they basically would have had all their weapon systems, all their armored vehicles facing out. And the likely enemy threat was from that direction. Now, in the center was the headquarters element where Worthington uh, was based and actually, unfortunately, where he died. It's said that he either was killed by a mortar round which landed in the center of the position just over there. And it's also said that he may well have been killed by um, typhoons which struck the position. So ground attack aircraft came in and identified that there were allies here. Worthington's men placed out air markers, so markers on the ground, to indicate that they were allies. Don't attack us. Um, so someone knew they were here. It just wasn't communicated well enough. So through the excellent research of Dr. Mike Bechtold, we have access to this plan from the BCR Museum giving us an insight into the troop dispositions within the fortress, where they positioned the vehicles. It's so accurate, in fact, that we can use it to identify the vehicles from the aerial photos. The first vehicle is the 17-pounder Sherman Firefly, annotated as hole down in a hollow. This was practically where I was standing in the corner of the field. And this was the most potent organic weapon systems that the Canadian had within the battle group. Next, we can see the Algonquin Regiment, three-inch mortars set back against the hedge. Now, this was the only indirect fire assets that the Canadians had. And in the centre, we have the Regimental Headquarters staff. Lieutenant Colonel Worthington's tank is highlighted right here, in the centre of the position by this tree. On that day, the Canadians were actually attacked in error by RAF typhoons. They were not expecting to see the large group of armour in this location. So the Canadians deployed ground-to-air identification panels, which you can see here. It's actually claimed in some sources that Colonel Worthington was killed by ground attack aircraft. But this is likely a confusion with his brother's death, because his brother unfortunately was killed when an RAF typhoon strafed his position during the battle for fillets. And these are just remarkable pictures. The next point then is that you can see that there's still a skyline here, and there's a wood block on that skyline. That's called 30 acre wood. That was actually occupied by the Germans. Now, lots of people think that if you're defending an area, you should stick your, uh, your armor on top of the hill, or you might have your defensive position on top of the hill. That's not what you would do. What you'd actually do is put it on the reverse of a slope so that you can see the enemy crest themselves. What you want to see is the enemy skylining themselves along that ridgeline so that you can start striking them with your mortars, the head mortars here, and for your direct fire weapon systems. So actually it's really well sighted. Less so in this direction, but actually they thought that's where the allies were. They thought the forward line of own troops was in that direction. And they knew the enemy was in this direction. So Lieutenant Colonel Worthington, you sighted this perfectly. Lots of people online, who criticised the decision to set up the fortress position here. And let me tell you now, this is a brilliant position. If you had to choose one in this location, and remember they were told to occupy Hill 195, which they believed this was Hill 195. It'd be really interesting to know just when they came to realise that this was the wrong location. Back to our map and you can see 30 acre wood approximately 600 meters away from the defensive position. It was from here that the Germans were preparing an attack and Worthington sent two troops from B squadron to disrupt the attack and to defeat the Germans in the wood block. They made it to the wood and discovered a network of trenches before they were engaged by Tiger tanks from the west and the south. Four Canadian tanks were knocked out at 30 acre wood. Lieutenant Stock came across Sergeant Warbank who had been wounded. He says, I found him stretched on the ground moaning, with one foot completely blown off and the boot lying about four foot away from the stump, with a long piece of Achilles tendon still attached. George had always been a great athlete and he'd always stated he would rather get it completely rather than lose a limb. He was staring down at the stump of his leg and he looked up at me. He said, you have your pistol, just kill me. So when we look at the imagery from 30 Acre Wood, you can clearly see the aftermath of a recent battle. 
There are smouldering wrecks that attest to the fighting that occurred here. The Canadians were successful in clearing the wood, but ultimately they had to withdraw with multiple casualties. Some casualties they left to even crawl back to the defensive position. And when we zoom into the photo, you can clearly identify four burning hulks from the brewed up Canadian tanks. Now the really interesting thing is that on, on the day that this battle happened, and actually at the exact same time, there was reconnaissance aircraft flying over. And as we've spoken about previously and shown the pictures, they were taking the photographs that are used to explain what happened here. And you can see the tank tracks from the Panthers, from the 12th SS Panzer Division who are closing in on this location, right where I'm standing now. And that's a bit of a scary thought to think that right here at that time, the battle group was defending themselves, fighting for their lives under indirect fire from mortars and artillery, but also being engaged from the flanks by Panthers. Uh, certainly you can identify one Panther in the photo and I'll put that up on the video. But I've just got the utmost respect for the people that were here. And in this picture, we have one such example of a German Panther moving towards the Canadian positions. It was flanking them from the east. The Canadians would lose 47 tanks in total and they would sustain 240 total casualties. The really frustrating thing is that this could have been successful. Essentially, Lieutenant Colonel Worthington, even though he had become lost and got in the wrong location, he'd achieved a breakthrough and he'd got in behind the enemy position. If the Allies had identified this and the Allies had supported him, if they'd reinforced him, then they could have achieved the breakthrough that they were after and totalize could have been a completely different story. This could have been a really successful event. And unfortunately, it's become a really sad and poignant event. Um, Canadians Alamo. They were defeated in detail right here in this field behind me. Now this film could not have been made without access to the excellent research of Dr. Mike Bechtel. And I've added the links in the description if you want to see this story in much more detail for yourself. I've also added links to a video by Brad Sinquart who has covered this event in detail. I've tried to be as fair as I possibly can in this video whilst obviously also trying to be respectful. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, then why not leave a like and also leave me a comment. I'd love to hear your views on what you think the Worthington Force could have done differently.